Hello, welcome to the self-learning podcast by Dr. Shishma Singh. Let us start discussion on Unit 13, Features of 73rd and 74th Constitutional Amendment. And our topic is Decentralized Planning in Context of 73rd and 74th Constitutional Amendment Act. Efforts to establish suitable planning machinery at the local levels have been half-hearted. The effective decentralization in planning in India existed at the state level. Vis-a-vis planning at the state level seems to depend very much on the size of the state. The planning machinery at the district level was weak both in terms of technical expertise and financial resources. There was virtually no such co-coordinating agency which could take the responsibility to link various existing programs and schemes so that they can be implemented effectively. Decentralized planning at the district level was effective precisely in those states where the performance in respect of land reform was better, like West Bengal, Karnataka and Jammu Kashmir belongs to this category. All the committees prior to 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment advocated decentralized planning. All these efforts culminated into the presentation of two bills, 64th and 65th constitutional amendment built in in the parliament in the election year of 1989 for providing constitutional status to the local government institutions in the rural and urban areas respectively. The two bills, though crucial steps towards decentralized planning, were passed by the Lok Sabha but fell in Rajya Sabha due to want of majority. Thus, it is obvious that none of these attempts towards decentralized planning in the post-independence era could satisfy the set of requisites the research team developed. Therefore, these efforts could not give desired results and the idea of decentralized planning remained a distant dream. It was felt necessary to build up and strengthen the planning capabilities at the district and block levels. Accordingly, the 73rd and 74th Amendment Acts were enacted, with the PRIs and municipalities setting constitutional status by way of 73rd and 74th Amendment Acts, respectively. Decentralized planning has got a new responsibility of formulation and implementation of the programs of economic development and social justice. It may be said that now onward there would be three tier in planning process with the center, the state and the panchayats. Now let us move to the next point, initiatives after economic reforms. In the wake of the economic reforms initiated by the Narsimha Rao-led Congress Ministry in the early 90s, the need for democratic decentralization planning was once again realized. This realization led to the passage of much talked about constitutional amendment acts. The two acts were regarded as milestone of decentralized governance and decentralized planning. In view of this, it becomes imperative to see as to how akin these two acts are to the idea of decentralized planning. For example, to what extent they satisfy the following prerequisites. Creation of regular bodies in the planning hierarchy. 
decentralization of power and functions to each of these tiers subordination to a higher political echelon rather than to bureaucracy assigning professionally trained manpower to each of these tiers devising effective coordination mechanism among these tiers and devising means to ensure effective people's participation now let us move to the next point creation of regular bodies article 243 b provided for the creation of a three tier structure of panchayats at the village block and district levels further article 243 e provided for a fixed tenure of 5 years of these local bodies legislatures of all the states in which the acts apply in consonance with the provisions of two acts have created the necessary structures in the urban and rural areas and are holding regular elections to them this shows that this 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment act satisfy essential prerequisites of centralized planning devolution of financial powers the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment acts have favored the devolution of financial powers through creation of 11th and 12th scheduled wide which functional and fiscal powers have been devolved to them upon the local government institutions however it is pertinent to note the two schedules by themselves do not contain subjects of the revenue resources except by way of incidental receipts the taxes duty tolls and fees to be levied by them assigned to them and the grant in aid to be given to them are left to the discretion of the state governments the two acts also provided for the appointment of panchayat finance commissions to look into the needs of the ruler and urban local bodies in totality and make su- suitable recommendations so as to enable these institutions to perform the assigned functions effectively this was definitely a landmark step in the direction of providing financial autonomy to the local bodies but it is noteworthy that though most of the states have constituted the pfcs but many of them have not yet submitted their report and in the case of those state finance commissions which have submitted their reports no tangible actions has been taken on their recommendations thus the above analysis shows that much leaves to be done for devolution of financial powers to these institutions and hence the third prerequisite of decentralized planning under the two acts also seems to be half heartedly attempted now the next point is subordination to higher political echelon rather than to bureaucracy as also hinted earlier one of the significant postulates of democracy is the subordination of bureaucracy to the democratically elected representatives of the people this is because bureaucracy is a good servant but a bad master this is as much applicable at the grassroots as at the center and the state levels ironically however the enactment of the different states have given upper hand to the bureaucracy we savis the representatives of the people at the local level the higher bureaucracy under the act of various states has been given the powers to suspend and even supersede these institutions 
In most of the states, it is the district level functionaries who regulate and control the working of these institutions. For instance, of the Haryana Panchayati Raj Act 1994 empowers the district development and panchayat officer or the subdivisional officer to suspend the execution of any resolution or order of the Gram Panchayat or prohibit the doing of any act. In this connection, the observations of the Garg Dred are also worth mentioning. The Karnataka Panchayati Raj Act vested the power of adjudging the performance of the panchayats with the bureaucracy under the Bihar Panchayati Raj Act 1993. Officials are also the controlling authority. Panchayat leaders have to tender their resignations to bureaucrats. The Haryana Panchayati Raj Act also confirms most of the powers on the bureaucracy or the government, leaving little room for panchayat to work independently. In several cases, the order of the director panchayat is not only final, but also cannot be questioned in any court of law. The government can cancel any resolution of the panchayat under the pretext of it being against the public interest. The Kela Panchayat Act is also an effort toward establishing of officers' Raj in place of people's Raj. The Himachal Pradesh Panchayati Raj Act has not given administrative and financial autonomy to panchayats for discharging their responsibilities effectively. The Punjab Panchayati Raj Act empowers the director panchayat to remove any sarpanch. The UP Assembly rectified the action such a hurry that the opposition was not given a chance even to discuss it. The Andhra Pradesh Panchayat Act 2 is no exception where control over the panchayat by the bureaucracy is concerned. Now let us move to the next point, assigning professionally trained manpower. Planning is a specialized activity required technical skill, information and database, which the people's representatives in a democracy cannot be expected to possess. Moreover, they are elected to the offices for a short period. On the other hand, bureaucracy being permanent has widely field experience and knowledge. Further, most of the information lies in official records, which remain in the custody of the bureaucracy. Thus, in a democracy, it is essential for planning to assign professionally trained manpower to the people's representatives and make them subordinate and subordinate to the latter. The dictomy is that they are always made responsible for the formulation and implementation of local plans without making the local bureaucracy subordinate and subservient to them. Rather, most of the authority has ever rested with the district administration. It is mainly because historically local government was virtually a part of district administration and with the emergence of the democratic aspirations of the people was gradually made a separate entity but was ever looked upon as only an offshoot and satellite of the district administration. Local government has a formidable competitor and a revival in the form of district administration. The 73rd and 74th Amendment Acts as well as the acts of the various state governments have also not made 
any progress in the direction of assigning professionally trained manpower to the local bodies and bringing the local bureaucracy under the local popular control. Therefore, the 73rd and 74th Amendment Acts have also not been able to qualify quality. this prerequisite of decentralized plan. Now let us wind up the session and take rest. Thank you very much for engaging yourself with the self-learning podcast.